message of our sermon and, and word today, but I want to do a little more background reading. So if you'll turn, for those of you who have your Bibles, to Acts chapter 6. We'll read the last few verses of chapter 6, starting at verse 8. And then we'll move over to chapter 7. I'm reading from the Common English Version Bible up this morning, so probably going to read a bit differently from yours. Pastor Mike has been sharing a little bit about the book of Acts. This is a continuation of the book of Luke, written by the same person. And where the book of Luke really, really deals with the, the truth of what Jesus' message was about, Acts deals with the, the early church. Okay, so it's it's the initial start of the church in, in the way in which this gospel is spread through the believers of Christ. All right, so this whole book um, is about how Christ reaches out even to Gentiles, to those beyond um, the, the um, Jewish community in order to save them. So this is kind of the culminating um, purpose of this book. All right, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Stephen, who stood out among the believers for the way God's grace was at work in his life and for his exceptional endowment with divine power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose from those who belonged to the so-called synagogue of former slaves or the freedmen. Members of Cyrene, Alexandria, Sicilia, and Asia entered into debate with Stephen. However, they couldn't resist the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly enticed some people to claim, we heard him insult Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders and the legal experts. They caught Stephen, dragged him away, and brought him before the Jerusalem council. Before the council, they presented false witnesses who testified. This man never stopped speaking against the holy place and the law. In fact, we heard him say that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, will destroy this place and alter the customary practices Moses gave us. Everyone seated in the council stared at Stephen. And they saw that his face was radiant, just like an angel. Go over to Acts chapter 7. We'll reread the portion of scripture read this morning. Starting at verse 51. You stubborn people. In your thoughts and hearing, you are like those who have no part in God's covenant. You continuously set yourself against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. Was there a single prophet your ancestors didn't harass? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And you betrayed and murdered him. You received the law given by angels, but you haven't kept it. Once the council members heard these words, they were enraged and began to grind their teeth at Stephen. But Stephen, enabled by the Holy Spirit, stared into heaven and saw God's majesty and Jesus standing at God's right side. He exclaimed, look! I can see heaven on display and the human one standing at God's right side. At this they shrieked and covered their ears. Together they charged him, threw him out of the city and began to stone him. The witnesses placed their coats in the care of a young man named Saul. As they battered him with stones, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, accept my life. Falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Then he died. Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. Dying to live. Dying to live. Let's bow for a word prayer. God, we come to the moment where we we'll seek to specifically hear a word from you. God, we pray that you are the one who will gather all of our wayward thoughts and bring us fully into this moment that we may receive the word that you intend for us to hear. We trust, God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will convict us each individually and collectively as you see fit such that we may be the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state shall be then, thenceforth, and forever free. 
And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will not and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. This is an excerpt from the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Abraham Lincoln. And we know from history that the proclamation of freedom alone is not enough to set a person completely free. Though there are governmental laws that are necessary Right? In order to ensure certain freedoms, right? For people. That law in and of itself is not powerful enough to truly make us free. Why? Because we are mortals. We get sick and we die. Right? Yet the words freedom and emancipation and liberation invoke in us these feelings of empowerment and invincibility. But is it invincibility an illusion? Because we will die. And maybe this is the problem with how hard it is for us to fully reach a point of being free. Maybe it's because we wake up every morning resisting death when it's inevitable. We wake up every morning racing towards death but we never ever want to die. Could it be that there's another way of thinking, another way of processing, another way of existing in this world that leads to freedom? I would argue yes, and I think Stephen may have the answer to that question. Stephen is one of the few good men chosen, one of seven, to see to the needs of the people who are um, on the margins of the community, the widows, the people who are sick and hungry, those who are the most vulnerable. But of these seven phenomenal men chosen to care for these people, Stephen is even set apart from them. Scripture says that he is full of the wisdom of God because of how the grace of God has moved in his life, because of the divine power on God's life, on his, that God has on his life. He is set apart. And after his ordination, he begins to do signs and wonders before and among the people. But there's an opposition that rises up against Stephen. From the people of a synagogue called the synagogue of the former slaves or the freed men. Again, to proclaim your freedom is not necessarily what makes you free. They argue back and forth with Stephen, even though they're having a hard time beating against the wisdom that God has given him to speak these words. I imagine they get a little frustrated because they can't out argue him, right? And so what do they do? They go and they find false witnesses to lie on Stephen. They grab him, they drag him before the council of Jerusalem. And Stephen is asked the question, are these things that they are accusing you of true? Stephen does not defend himself. He simply embarks on the story of God's people. He literally tells the whole story of the Old Testament. Go back and read it. That's why I didn't read it this morning. It's the whole story. But he ends this impassioned speech with a conviction that accuses his accusers of not following the law of God. Even in that moment, these council people are staring at him and they're seeing that there's something different about him. There's something special about him. They say that his face looks like that of an angel. But once he makes these accusations, he hits at their pride and they become angry, enraged. They become so angry that they begin to grind their teeth at Stephen. And Stephen, completely, seemingly completely oblivious to their anger, gazes beyond the manifestations of this physical world and he sees into heaven and he says, Oh, I see God in all his glory. And Jesus is standing at his right side. Oh, this is way too much for them to handle. They begin to scream like little kids and cover their ears. 
They grab him, they beat him, they drag him to the outskirts of the city. They take off their coats so they'll be free to you know, do what they're about to do. And they lay these coats at the foot of a man named Saul. They pick up stones of varying sizes, jagged stones and rough stones and smooth stones, and they begin to throw these stones into Stephen's flesh with all their strength over and over and over again, violently polarizing his body. Stephen prays to God, Lord, accept my life. And what amazes me is that the scripture says that then he falls to his knees. So he has pretty much endured this entire assault on his feet. He falls to his knees and the last words he speaks are, Lord, now hold this sin against and he died. And some of you may be saying, if Stephen is free, and this is where his freedom led him, I don't want to pause that for you. Right? And that may be a reasonable way of thinking. However, I would disagree. I would say that we actually want exactly what Stephen had, whether we know it or not. There's something innate in us that is driving us to actually want to reach the place that Stephen reached. And the answer to where he reached is freedom is found in this term that we've been talking about called revolution. A revolution, a procedure, a circuit, right? A circuit back to an original starting point. Now if we look at salvation, just the basic definition of salvation, it means to return or to reconnect to God, right? To return to an original, um, intent, the originally intended relationship that we are supposed to have with God, right? Sanctification, we talk a lot about sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification is the process of change. It's that process that leads us to what it means to be holy, to be different, to be changed. So the processes of salvation, and sanctification are in fact revolutions. They are cycles that lead us back to what God originally intended for us. I am proposing that Stephen was nearing the end of this revolutionary cycle. Because at the heart of every true revolution is freedom. And it is a freedom that is so counter to the ways of this world that it stands out as different, as changed. Stephen lived a revolutionary life. Let's look at how we know that. First, we know Stephen lived a revolutionary life because his freedom, his freedom bound him to others in love. His freedom bound him to others in love. When we start talking about freedom, we usually start to think about autonomy or individuality, right? I'm free, right? Nowhere in this passage do we hear Stephen ever say, I'm free to make the choices that I want to make. I'm free to believe what I want to believe. I'm grown. I'm a grown man trying to tell me what I need to believe. At no point does he say that or does he even speak those words. Rather, his freedom did not lead him to this sense of individuality. His freedom led him to this place that he was realizing that he was created to be connected to other people, bound to other people. You see, he was free to love others because he knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loved him. God's love for him was not in question. He was very secure in the fact that God's unending love for him freed him to love somebody else. That's a powerful thing. You see, people who are not secure, who are not fully free, spend a lot of their time trying to prove to other people their worth and their value. Trying to prove that they deserve what God has given to them. Well, none of us deserve it. Right? But freedom means being able to live in this true existence and reality that God's love is our worth and our value and that frees us to be comfortably who we are. I don't have to walk around proving anything, right? 
I grew up as a child who I was very defensive. Very defensive. Everywhere I went, people was calling me out on my defensiveness. Right? And as I reached my young adulthood, I realized that this was something that needed to be checked. Right? We all know that maturity at some point is a choice. Right? We choose to mature at a certain point in our life. Right? You just don't, it just doesn't happen. You say, no, I'm going to start on this path. So I reached a point where I said, I am tired of being defensive. Right? And so I talked to God about it. I talked to some other people about it. And I reached a point where I have a boundary within my life. And that is, there's a trigger that goes off in me. When I begin to, if I'm in a conversation or if I'm in a situation where I begin to feel defensive. Right? Like I need to defend myself. Immediately that trigger tells me that I need to shut up and listen. Right? Because if I keep talking, I'm not going to hear what they say. They're not going to hear what I say. And this whole conversation is going to be pointless. Right? This defensiveness. There was a growth point in which God says, no, you need to be quiet and just listen. There's a trigger for me. Being free means being able to live day by day in the reality that God's love for you does not change and that validates you, period. Right? Stephen was free to love somebody else. Nelson Mandela, revolutionary and politician, spent 27 years in prison for fighting against an oppressive government. Right? When he is finally free, he becomes the first black South African to be the president of South Africa. Right? One of the things he is quoted as saying is he says, for to live free is not simply or merely to cast off one's chains but it's to live your life in such a way that you are able to enhance and respect the freedom of others. His last words were, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And what is sin? Sin is a bind that keeps us from being on a revolutionary cycle towards God. They are chains in our life. He spoke for the freedom of somebody else. He did not say to God in those last moments, Lord, punish them for how they are hurting me. Rather, he prayed for their exoneration. In that moment, he forgave. And then he died. So we first know that he's living a revolutionary life because he was bound by love to others. The second way we know is that he was able to speak the truth even in the face of death. He was able to speak the truth even in the face of death. He does not defend himself at all. He's asked to defend himself, but he doesn't, right? He doesn't have to defend himself. It's irrelevant. Why is it irrelevant? It's irrelevant because in this moment, it wasn't about him defending his own honor, his own belief, his own understanding of what he chooses to believe, right? In that moment when he was asked to defend himself, what did he do? He simply spoke the truth. There's a whole story that I heard somewhere a long time ago, and it's about a king who decides that he wants to have a bride, he wants to get married. And so he calls us his, he calls his wisest, oldest advisor, Sophia to him and he says to her, I want to find a wife and I want you to pick her. She says, okay, but I can't pick from all these girls. I want you to pull your advisors together, get them to narrow down three girls and bring them to me and then I'll choose. He says, okay, fine. Takes them several weeks to do this. They bring the three maidens to him. All the people are gathered. Sophia comes up and she says, okay. She says, there's a place in the woods from which we can see a magical mountain. But the only eyes that can really see this magical mountain are the eyes of the true queen. So I'm going to take each of you individually, and whoever describes the mountain properly will be our queen. She takes maiden number one down into the woods to the special place. There's a break in the trees, and she points up and she says, what do you see? She says, oh, I see a beautiful magical mountain. Covered in golden blooms and sparkling crystals. Sophia looks at her and she's like, that ain't the right mountain. <laughs> she 
goes back. Baby number two comes to the same place. She looks up and she points and she says, what do you see? She says, oh, I've never seen anything more beautiful in my whole life. It is a mountain covered in rubies and sapphires. <laughs> no, baby, that ain't the right now. <laughs> the third maiden comes nervous because the other two have come back crying, right? <laughs> and hollering, because they ain't seen the right now. She says, what do you see? Stands there. She turns to some tears. The tears stay down. And she says, I don't see anything. I don't see a magical mountain. Sophia wipes her tears and she says, my most honorable and beautiful queen, you have seen the right mountain because there is no mountain. <laughs> Revolutionary living, emancipation, freedom is marked by the fact that you can speak the truth no matter what it's going to cost you. Amen. No matter what's at stake. Yes. You can say what is real and true, no matter what. The third way, we know that Stephen was living a revolutionary life, and maybe the most important, is that he was willing to die in order to live. He was willing to die in order to live. One of my favorite Christian bands, called Gungu, the Gungu Man. And they sing a song that says, like the waters flooding the desert, or like the sunrise that shows all things, when it comes, flowers bloom, lions sleep, gravestones roll. When death dies, all things live. One of the definitions of revolution is radical change, radical newness, right? This understanding of a, a procedure that is so far beyond the bounds of normal procedure that is considered radical. Now, we look at the definition of death. Death means to cease to exist, to cease to live, right? It is a perfect, permanent cessation of vital function. Now, Nothing about Stephen's action says that he believed this to be a permanent reality. It was almost as if to him, death, like Gungor says, has actually died. What does it mean for death to die? For death to die, it has to be so completely radically changed that it is considered a revolution. Such that death no longer becomes a permanent ceasing of existence, but life, death leads actually to life. It is revolutionized. Yes. One of my favorite theologians, Herbert McCain, says, he says, through the resurrection of Christ, we find that death is not merely destruction or the end of life, but rather it is a revolution. It is a new life beginning, mm -hmm. an unpredictable life beginning. Mm -hmm. And because the world is a crucified world and it is Christ um, rejecting even in its bodily function, mm -hmm. right? That it is it, the only way for us as humans to actually live into our destiny, to actually become people who are unified in love, is that something this powerful and this strong has to happen. Death has to be revolutionized. What does it mean for us to live our lives as if we are really eternal? Either we're eternal or we're not. Either we live forever or we don't. Right? What does it mean to live your life in such a way that you are not bound by the permanent end that people speak about all the time? What does it mean for us to live into this reality that death has died? That we serve a God strong enough to kill death? And yet every day we say we believe this, right? This is like the mark of our faith. This is like the core of our belief. We say we believe this, but yet we fight against stuff that needs to die in us all the time. Yeah. Stuff that needs to die in order for us to actually live, for Christ to thrive in us. Right. Why is that so? Because even though we know that death has died, and even though we know that life will always come, the process of this stuff dying in us is still hard to bear. Amen. 
is a difficult process. Revolutions are marked by violence and destruction. But there are some things that need to die in order for life to come. A few years ago, National Geographic um, did this documentary on this young girl who was named for an Indian deity, um, Lakshmi, who had eight limbs. And the reason she was named for her is because she was born with four legs and four arms. Right? How is this possible, you say? Because she was actually um, joined at the hip to a twin that did not fully develop, a partially developed twin, all right? And so people from all over India were traveling to this small remote village to see this girl because they thought that she was the reincarnation of their goddess, Lakshmi, right? But eventually the parents had to decide to remove this partially developed remains of her twin because it, become, it had become parasitic. What does that mean? That means that in order for their daughter to live, these parasitic remains had to die. I don't know what needs to die in your life. I don't know what you need to die to. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But something in you needs to die in order for you to really be free, in order for you to really live, in order for you to really live a revolutionary life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you need to stop making some calls. Maybe it's a way of thinking. Maybe it's some habits and addiction. Maybe it's some things that you do that takes you to spaces of euphoric, of euphoric natures that only God should take you to. Highs that only God should be able to move you in. Maybe it's some stuff that you constantly justify before you do it. Right? You have that thought, no, I shouldn't do this. No, but I can do this because I work hard this week. <laughs> So God understands he ain't going to be no husband or no wife yet. Right? I don't know what needs to die in you. I don't know whether it's rage or anger or addiction. All I'm saying is that there is something that needs to die in you. And even though it's going to be hard to let that thing die, I promise you there is life on the other side. Whatever we feel that God, whatever we feel that that thing is going to take from us, whatever we feel like that thing gives to us, God is saying, I can give you something. Yes. If you're willing to let it die. Because if we are able to take these steps towards letting these things die, then we always want to be able to reach a point where if we're ever faced with the option of having to give our life for somebody else so that they might live, we can easily make that decision knowing that God will raise us from the dead. Yes. But all of these processes are a part of it. There are people out there who are killing folk simply because they don't value life. What will it look like for them to understand that through Christ, death has died, and they are transformed to the extent that they are able to protect the lives that they right now are trying to kill? What does it look like for people who live their lives as if they're invincible based upon their own skills to actually be transformed, to understand that through Christ they can be invincible? Romans 8 tells us that in all these things, we are more than conquerors, yeah. right? Invincibility means unconquerable. And so Romans tells us that once we reach the point of conquering, there's still more. That conquering isn't it. Like, we don't just conquer and we have this big celebration and bam. No, there is conquering and then there is more than conquering. Now, who wrote Romans? Does anybody know? Paul. Who is Paul? Paul is the man formerly known as Saul. Who is Saul? Saul is the man standing at Stephen's murder in full agreement with him. He is the man who persecuted and killed Christians. He is the man who also wrote more than, more than half of our whole New Testament Bible. Stephen's revolutionary cycle was ending, but it was marking the beginning of that of a murderer. A murderer who became so incredibly revolutionized that he began to endure the same pains he was inflicting on people before he got saved. I don't know what you've done in your life. All I'm saying to you is that there is nothing that you've done in your life that God cannot revolve back around to what he intended for you. There is life here. Now this isn't about being marvelous. I mean, this is not about marvelous. This is 
is not about God, please kill me for your sake. <laughs> right? I used to teach a freshman studies course and whew, God bless my students. Right? One of the assignments was that they had to write their obituary. And it was designed so that they could see what their real goals and desires were. How do you project your life? Right? And so they're reading their obituaries and one of the brothers who I spent quite a bit of time with, God bless his soul, he's so special. <laughs> he got to the part where he dies. Now this brother's like 20. He had himself dying at age 26 by an assassin. He's gonna be assassinated at age 26. And brother, no, wait a minute now. You, you trying to make it through school, right? <laughs> and between the, the time that you're 20 to the time that you're 26, he, he says that he's, he's gonna be an activist and that people gonna have a hit out of his life and that that's how he's gonna go out. <laughs> now I'm not saying it's not, you know, honorable for him to want to live his life in such a way that he's willing to die for this cause. But I am saying that God has never asked us, right, to pursue death, right, Amen. as a means of loving him or being liberated. All God is saying is that there may come a time where you reach this point. And when you reach it, if you reach it, I want you to be free to make that choice. Right? But Kate said that Christ did not come so to be crucified. He came to be so fully loving towards us and to give us life that it was inevitable that his death and resurrection would happen. Why? Because this world is a rejecting world. And the only thing deep enough to save us was death and resurrection. So now you may be asking, what do I do? What steps do I take? First of all, I need you to be mindful of the fact that this is a revolution, this is a journey, all right? And so it's gonna take some time. Amen. But this is gonna get you started. First, first you have to decide whether or not this person that we're talking about, Christ, fully human, fully divine, has the capacity to do what we say that he has the capacity to do. If you believe that Christ has the capacity to save you, that Christ has conquered death on the cross, that Christ has killed death, and you haven't made a public confession, that's your first step. You say, no, I believe that Christ is my Savior. That's step number one. You've already done it. Step number two this week, I want you to get out a piece of paper, and I want you to get out a pen, and I want you to dig deep. deep. And I want you to consider the things that you think, you think, you need to die to in your life. Consider those areas, those things that you just feel like you can't live without. And I'm not saying that these are necessarily areas that automatically classify quote unquote as sin. There are some things that we do and we use in the wrong way. Relationships that we use in the wrong way. Right? That in and of themselves there's nothing wrong with it, but because of how much power and energy we put into them away from God become an issue that needs to be cut off. I want you writing down those few things. I also want you to write down the last time you can remember either lying or being tempted to lie. Even in those moments where you feel like it was an honorable lie. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, we're not gonna go into the honorable lie thing. I mean, I know there are times, you know, where the same piece, we just say, we gotta say, like that commercial with that brother, you know, his wife says, is my butler being in this dress? And he says, uh, 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 no. Right? Honorable lie, right? I wanna keep peace in my house. But I want you to think back, genuinely think back. What are those situations in which I am tempted to not be truthful and honest? Write those down. What's going on inside of me? I also want you to write down the times in which you feel insecure and those moments in which you feel like you have to prove your worth. Maybe it's on your job or maybe it's in church. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's when you're around your friends. I don't know where it is. Just write down those times where you feel like you were just not quite as good as other people. Write them down. Then I want you to spend some time in prayer with God, asking God to really dig deep, to really show you those areas in which you need to die. God, I've made this list. These are the things that I am conscious of, but what are the things that I am unconscious of? Dig deep with God. Right? Ask God to, to bring out some liberation in you. 
right? To help free you, to bring you to the places of courage. Or ask God to even elevate for you those moments in which those times come if you can't think of any. Okay, God, well, just prompt my spirit when I'm in that moment. The last thing I want you to do, and this is probably maybe even the most important, and that is, if you are being discipled by somebody, I need for you to prayerfully be considering who in the community is wise, is God-fearing, is a little bit mature, more mature than you, who can disciple you. What does that mean? Who can step you through this process? Who are you going to give permission to hold you accountable? There are people in my life who I explicitly say, call me out. Right? That's a part of the discipleship. But these are also people who are going to tell you what you, what they see in you that maybe you don't see in yourself. These are people who can pray with you. Right? Who can guide you. Who can help you on this revolutionary living path. Now, Pastor Mike and I are always open to meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one, and we do sessions on a regular basis. But we are heavily involved in discipling and and um, leading a lot of our leaders, right? I need you to know that we're always accessible, but there are other people in this community who can do this for you. Our live groups, many of them are a break for the summer. They start back up, I think, in what, August, September? But there are a couple of groups that are still open. You need to be disciple. God knew that we could not just be accountable to God alone. Why? Because it's so easy to ignore God. But it's a lot harder to ignore me when I'm in your face. <laughs> right? Calling you all the time, knocking on your door. Why are you transing your phone? <laughs> right? Your phone ringing and you pushing a button, you know, sending it to voicemail. I know. We look. We can just turn it off. No, not today, not today. All right? So let's do these things. Let's do these things. Why? Because there is too much at stake. There's too much at stake. This is what separates us as Christians from other religions. One, the grace of God, that we are saved by grace. And two, the resurrection of the dead. Folk gotta know that. That's the only way they're gonna come to life. So wherever you are, everybody, I close.